you missed that great introduction. Anyway, uh, one of the guys that was deported some years before and has uh, found favor in the court there is this guy named Nehemiah. Don't know a whole lot about him except like Joseph in Pharaoh's court and like others where God took them in adverse circumstances and gave them favor and position. Nehemiah has ascended to a role that we learn in the first chapter is the cupbearer to the king. And that was a great role. You were intimately associated with the ruler of the land. You were the cupbearer. I mean, you, you bore him the drink and often the food that he would partake of. The bad news about that job is you would taste it sometimes in advance so that you would discover if there was poison. They would wait five minutes, and if you didn't die, then they would hand it on to the king. So sometimes there was turnover in that job. So Nehemiah enjoyed that role, found favor, and if you had not interrupted him, as it, ha as it does happen in chapter one, he probably would have served that out the rest of his life. But his brother, I guess from the homeland, makes a journey and comes all the way to where he is in Babylon and says, we got some bad news. The city is destroyed, and in particular, the wall is broken down. Now, that doesn't mean much to us today. We have cops and we have security, but in those days, your best secured city had a wall around it. It is what you found is your best way to secure uh, your whole livelihood and family. Oh, thank you. I'm so into the game. I'm forgotten. Thank you. Appreciate that. Unfortunately, now you got to look at me. What do you do if you're Nehemiah and you hear that there is this horrible, long lasting disaster back in your homeland? Well, if you read chapter one, you'll find his immediate reaction is the one that you and I should have when we get bad news. And that is he prayed. He got down and he's prayed this great prayer of contrition, asking for forgiveness, asking for favor, asking for some way to remedy the broken down wall. We read chapter two, he makes a risky move and he goes into the presence of the king Artaxerxes and he does what you're not supposed to do. He appeared sad. The, the law said that you could only appear cheerful and happy in the presence of the king so as not to be a downer in the court. He risked that, the king saw that, and because he liked Nehemiah, he said, what's wrong? He tells him the bad news, and then God has given him favor, has answered his prayer, and Artaxerxes Artaxerx, says, what do you need? He says, well, I'd love to go back, and could you also resource it, fit the bill, so we can rebuild the, the wall and the gates? So that's granted. He gets to go back. At the end of chapter 2, he meets up with some of the remnant who are there who are struggling, and he inspires them with what God has promised. And it's a great uh, end of the chapter where he's telling them all this stuff and he's talking about the challenge. And then he says, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we, his servants, will arise and build. And so they begin the work of rebuilding the wall. Now, if you've also read Nehemiah, you know you get to chapter three and then all of a sudden it's just this list of people and tribes and sections of the wall they're working on. You may fast forward through that. Don't do that. Because it's one of those great places where God honors and records and celebrates people like you and me who do, do little work on the wall right in front of us. Their names are recorded for all biblical history. Isn't that kind of cool? God never forgets our work. But then we open up chapter four, the section that I read a moment ago. And now the surrounding kings who really relish the fact that the wall is broken down and Jerusalem is no longer strong, the whole nation is weak. They now have seen a project begin. And the, in chapter four, we're at the midway point of rebuilding this wall. By the way, by chapter six, spoiler alert, they rebuild the wall in record time in 52 days. I'd love to see DOT get on that program. <laughs> You, Donnie, <laughs> out here. How long has that been? It's been longer than 52. <laughs> but they had God equipping and enabling and inspiring. But in chapter four, they're only reaching the midway point. And so these two rivals of Israel come out. One is Tobiah and the other is Geshem. And they come out and they employ a strategy to try to stop the work. It's an age-old strategy. It's worn out. It's been used against you and me many times. If you've ever endeavored to do a great thing, in particular, if you've ever endeavored to do a great thing for God, 
There will always be the naysayers. There will always be the ones who employ the weapon called ridicule. You ever been ridiculed? Could have been a stranger. It could have been a close family member. It could have been your spouse. It could have been your kids. Why are you doing that? This is not going to succeed. You're foolish. You're dumb. Look at the words of these two kings as they speak these ridicules to them. And notice their sequence. I'll try to point that out in just a minute. The first three ridicules have to do with pointing out their limitations. Has anybody ever said that to you? You're just not able. The first limitation, they say, what are these emphasis on the word feeble Jews doing? You're all weak people. You have limited personal ability. The second insult or ridicule says, will they, plural, restore it by themselves? So even if you put your efforts together, corporately you're weak. Individually you're weak. Corporately you're weak. And then I love this one. Will they sacrifice? Well, that specifically means like they did in the day of the multi-gods of the day, you sacrifice your favorite deity and he supernaturally helps you. So they're saying, okay, even if you were as a corporate entity able to build, you don't have divine empowerment through your sacrifices. You're limited three ways, personal, corporate, and divine. But they don't stop there. Assuming all that did work, will they finish up in a day? Now the limitation is time. You just don't have enough time. Thank you for your effort, and maybe you have the strength, but you're going to run out of time. The next one, will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and the burned ones at that? These were limestones, massive rocks. You can go to Jerusalem. You can go to the old city today. You can see remnants of some of these great big stones. Hard to imagine that they were able to lift them and move them and put them in place. And so when they were destroyed, it took major effort. And they got burned. Limestone will actually char and weaken. It won't make the same strength tensile as it had before. So the kings point out, look at your raw materials. You're not importing any more rocks from the quarry. Are you going to rebuild with the rubble that's already weak? Limitation of time, limitation of resources. And so Tobiah is, Sanballat's done, so Tobiah steps up to the mic. Hey, I got one more thing I can ridicule. I love this one. Yes, what if they, what are they building? And if a fox goes up on it, he will break down the stone wall. How, how heavy is a fox? Now, I had to research that. There are all kinds of foxes around the world. I don't really know the indigenous foxes of Israel. But the average weight of a fox around here is 10 to 14 pounds. So what is this insult? Even if you built that and got it all built up, a 10-pound being will walk across it and make it fall. You don't have any lasting result, even if you get it done. Now, you're Nehemiah, and you're the people working with Nehemiah to make this happen. What are you hearing? How does that hurt? Let me review it again in this way. Here's how they build together. You don't have enough strength within yourself. Secondly, even if you did, this work will require more effort than all of you have together. Number three, but even if you could do that, all of you, you still need God's strength and favor and your sacrifices won't sway him to bring help to you. Number four, and even if God does help you, you just don't have enough time to complete the project. And even if you had plenty of time, you don't even have decent building materials. <laughs> Let's just say for the sake of discussion, you did complete the project, it would fall down under minimal pressure. You may have identified with one or all of these six ridicules. You've probably heard them sometime when you made a risky move and tried to do something for God. They hurt. Worse, they paralyze. You may be like the people to stop working. And Nehemiah steps up at the end of that sixth insult, and he begins to pray like he always does. Hear, O our God, for we are despised by these two kings. 
turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captive. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. And so we built the wall. Oh, I just love that. In front of you, we built the wall. How are you and I going to overcome ridicule when it comes? I think the Bible is amazing in that it provides for me, at least in all six areas, a biblical promise that I can counter that particular ridicule with. For example, what if someone comes to me and says, you don't have either the personal ability or the corporate ability to succeed? And mind you, we're not talking self-sufficiency here. We're talking about sufficiency through God. Well, all of us could remember Philippians 4.13 at that point. What does it say? I can do all things through strife, so the Christ who gives me strength. Ephesians 3 is a wonderful chapter to go to in this regard. Paul records, for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, by the way, that's pretty good. That's a bigger bank account than you and I will ever have. Out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. But he keeps going. He says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints. So it's individual and corporate to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that his love surpasses knowledge and that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. I need a ladder. I need to get bigger on that. But he's not done there. The famous conclusion, he says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more. What does more mean in the Greek? More, thank you. To do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to the power that's at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ through Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever. And ever. We're able through him. <laughs> what about divine availability? Romans 8. You know this passage. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers in any heights or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of our God that's in Christ Jesus. What about the issue of time? When you feel like I can't get it done in the amount of allotted time. I always remember what some preacher said many years ago. I, I can't get it out of my brain. God's different. He doesn't play nine inning ball games. It's his bat. It's his ball. He swings till he hits. Now, I literally grew up in a neighborhood where we did old fashioned sandlot baseball. We had the vacant lot and everybody just brought whatever equipment you happen to have. And it was all dirty and messed up, but we played. We'd throw a rock out there to be second base, and that was dangerous to slide into, I can tell you. But there was one kid on the street who was the rich kid. He couldn't play baseball at all, but he had the shiny ball, the white ball. Ours were all brown. And he had a, a relatively new wooden bat. So we let him play so we could get the use of that. He'd come up to hit, and he'd miss the ball by two feet. He'd turn around and say, no, my bat. My ball, I swing until I hit. And about the 25th pitch, he would foul one off into the neighbor's backyard. We call it an inside the park home run, and he would be happy. God, same way. Philippians 1 says, I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this. What was Paul confident of? that he who began a good work back in time, began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until when? What's the deadline for, for God? Until the day of Christ. <laughs> that gives him plenty of time, doesn't it? Um, in Christian growth, what is the promise of success? Romans 16, now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the pro proclamation of the Jesus, our Lord. He establishes in our trials, 
Ephesians 6, therefore put on the whole armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground in suffering. Paul writes to Timothy, that is why I'm suffering as I am, yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and I'm convinced he is able to guard. In total protection, Jude, that little next to last book in the Bible, to him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault, fault and great joy. Now that's a lot. When the ridicule comes, we need a lot to counter it and keep working. As I said, it's not many days later after this episode that they finish the record building of a record wall in record time in 52 days. So what do I need to know as I, I listen to the story of Nehemiah? I think I can sum it up and just... We probably all can cite the first line. Say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Stop. That's all you need. In fact, I heard the story of a preacher in Virginia many years ago who would send into the editor on Friday his sermon topic for that weekend. It would go in the religion section. People would know in advance what he was going to preach on. So this particular week, he called in and said, the topic for a message is the Lord is my shepherd. And the editor, who wasn't necessarily a Christian church guy, he said, is that all? And he said, well, that's enough. Don't hear anything. Don't hear anything. Yeah, we lost Steve. They're going to sign back on. He's coming back on now. Asked him to stand and read that. But Richard Burton had laid a caveat into the request. He said, I will read it, Pastor, but you got to read it after me. So Richard Burton gets up, as you can imagine, just incredibly eloquent. And when he was done building to a crescendo, the, the attending office stood to their feet and applauded with great gusto. He sits down and then the humble 50 year pastor stood up and read it. It was totally different. But Richard Burton noticed around the room, people were not standing and applauding, they were weeping. And they were just, so moved by his presentation of the very same words. When he was finished and people could barely speak, somebody tapped Richard Burton on the shoulder and said, how is it that when you read that same piece, people stood and applauded, but when he read it, people weeped and seemed so joyful? Richard Burton said, you see, I know the psalm but he knows the shepherd. <laughs> and that's the, that's the takeaway from Nehemiah. If you know the shepherd, you shall not want. You build a mighty project for God, you shall not want. You devote your life to a ministry. You devote yourself to being a faithful attender and, and a faithful layman of a church. You go on mission trips. You do whatever you do for God, and people ridicule you. You say, I don't care. The Lord's my shepherd. I got all I need. That is enough. So isn't it great that no matter what comes, God has given us a, a comeback that will allow us to keep our work on the wall. Father, I am so grateful to know you as not only my Lord and Savior and King and Redeemer and great physician, but I know you as my shepherd. And that means I'm a sheep and a dumb one at that. I'm in desperate need of your leadership every day. I'm in desperate need of your resourcing, your watch care, your protection. But oh, isn't it good that you promised to be my shepherd. Help me in my endeavors in the future to do all I can to draw deep upon your resources and continually give the credit to you so others may taste and see what I know, and that is that you are good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, apologies to you guys on Zoom. The internet's broken up twice, as you know. And we're finally back together, so hopefully you didn't miss too much. But let's take a few minutes uh, to talk about what this means to you. Maybe you have a story of where you found yourself on the receiving end of ridicule, or maybe you just didn't feel like you were adequate and God came through in a resourceful way. 
What are your thoughts? Seems to me that um, that the devil's been knocking down the uh, the wall of the church here in America really, really hard the last few years. And right now, he's got people in leadership and government and media that are trying to stomp out the last embers of the living church. And it's our job to rebuild that wall because um, Satan wants to take it out so that he can bring it up his he can bring up his antichrist so um this is a challenge this message is a challenge for us to 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 be um the ones who lift the stones and put that wall back together and um i think it's a it's a message for our time eric i see your hand up there in michigan well, hello. Good evening. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, I'm all caught up with doing taxes. My brain is a mess, but I got to figure it out and should get some money back again. Thank goodness. Um, you know, I went to Bill Lamb when he was living in Michigan. He went to a Brightmore church and I went there on Sunday and um, I met somebody in the doctor's office that um knew him and knew the pastor and that's where i went again to um see if they would be there but they gave me a name of a man and he was his name was um amitab singh from india and i had just gotten a message from a pastor friend of mine in india and he wanted to make contact with some preachers in usa michigan so what a small world. So I, I ran into Amitab when I was there and he was so delighted and I've given him communication so that he can um, connect with uh, Pastor Abraham Duna in um, India where Mel Karska or Mel Williams is right now. And he'll be preaching at his church on, um, on Sunday and they're having a, a revival on the 18th. And then they're dedicating on the 19th, uh, Pastor Abraham's house. And um, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, but I talked to Pastor Amitab at Brightmore, and I told him of Abraham, and he's going to connect with him. And in 2021, they had missionaries, many missionaries in India. But now they're doing it in Africa. And I asked him if he could possibly make... Um, Pastor Abraham, who his ministries is, um, um, what is it? Um, Great Awareness Christian Church in India. And uh, he said, well, I think we're going to add him to our missionaries. So that was a wonderful thing that off of a suggestion from Pastor Abraham that I was able to make his church a ministry um, there. Um, for the church in, in India. And it's a wonderful thing. You know, it's funny when I met these people in the doctor's office the other day, um, I was reading Bill Lamb's book and um, he happened to have a Muhammad Ali shirt on. And I knew Muhammad, Muhammad Ali quite well. And um, I went over and I said, you know, I honor the greats. And we got talking and told him my testimony and got involved. And um, he said, um, what church you go to off the subject? And I said, well, sometimes I visit Brightmore Church. He said, oh my gosh, I'm dear friends with the pastor there. I said, so am I. And so is Coach Lamb. And um, and Coach Lamb is going to be here, I think, uh, next week to see um, Pastor Jamie. And um, I told him that, you know, we were going to do um, – meetings there back a while back before bill got into the wrestling with life we were going to do meetings in that church for um people with dementia and alzheimer's and we were offered the whole church and to be able to do a witness there and it was a wonderful thing but we keep in touch with pastor jamie and it's, it's a wonderful thing so i i just thought i'd pass that story but anyways he i saw the shirt and I was telling him all these stories and I said, hold on a minute. I went over and got the book and I said, look at this. 
And that's where um, Coach Lamon written in it and um, Mary uh, Lots Graham had written in it and um, where Mel Williams had written in it. And he says, I told him, I says, oh, you should believe me now. <laughs> he got a big kick out of that. But that book has gone a long ways. It's a wonderful book. Um, Jackie read it first and she liked it. We're, we've been friends with them for a long time. We're in wrestling together. I'm almost the same age, but I was at the Olympic level. He was at the um, college level. Um, I gave my efforts to the Olympic level because uh, one of my mentors was uh, um, 46 years. Uh, I was with him and he was a wonderful man. So, but Bill and I caught up in the end um, in wrestling and, what a wonderful thing is that he changed his life and it had that accident that woke him up and he was in uh, Israel with um, Mal Williams and they were walking down the path and Coach Lamb accepted Christ walking down that path. And I say, my gosh, is that a wonderful thing? And he's a good servant for the Lord now. And uh, the book is a good book for Christianity how man can go into overtime and find the Lord. And um, we just honor Bill Lamb so much because he's a great man. And um, I thought you should know that story. Thank you, amen. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, Bill was sorry he couldn't be here today. He sent us a, uh, a note saying that he was involved with NCAA today. And uh, I guess that means he's at home watching TV. Yeah, I don't that's know. That's what that means. That's, <laughs> that's code. Uh, PH, I think you were trying to get in. PH, you got to unmute there. Uh, we, there you go. Okay. Uh, Steve, your presentation reminded me of uh, the same type of thing that happens in the military. Uh, it happened to me, and in regards to ridicule, and uh, even more important, your fitness reports. I was threatened if I ran against the chairman of the Democratic Party that I would be on the hit list. I didn't pay any attention. I ran, and the marks that were put on my fitness report by my next commanding officer, who was a deputy attorney general, <clears throat> were the lowest that anybody has ever seen in the military. <clears throat> it nearly cost me my career. But <clears throat> in the military, you learn to take your lumps. <clears throat> in fact, you have to sign a statement that you essentially, I guess you concur with this. I don't know, <clears throat> but they call you in and you sign a statement. But uh, it cost me a, a strike. And um, unfortunately, in the past, I hope this is not going on now, but in the past, uh, the sexual harassment and even more the sexual rapes uh, if they happen between uh, a senior and junior, the same thing would happen. They would call you in, and, uh, and I've never got involved in any of that, but uh, uh, th that's the way the military worked then. And and you 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 sign, and you keep on, and you and you you take your lumps, and you keep going. The next day, you're breaking a code, or you're uh, uh, springing somebody out of jail, or or, or whatever, but um, that is, um, I have, uh, I've, I've, I've suffered that more than once, but that was the most serious time, and um, it's, uh, it, it, it's there, and it's in the military, and you just have to learn to take it and go on. So ridicule happens even in the military, is what you're saying. Yeah. Well, at that time, I was not uh, that close to God. I was a Christian, and I, in fact, I was the uh, um, uh, civilian uh, 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 minister uh, on, on our uh, unit. But 
you, you just you just have to take it in. Uh, you, you don't have anybody you can go to. Well, the rest of the story in Nehemiah is they depended on God in the midst of their challenges. But there's a great line that says that they got up on the wall to work after that. They had a tool in one hand. They had a weapon in the other. So they were savvy enough to protect themselves even in that adverse circumstance. The book of Nehemiah is just a great easy read sometime just for the, the value of leadership, value of adversity. So you just got a snippet of it today. Go home and read the rest of the book. It's really good. Mike. I'm going to share a story I shared with Rick walking in today. And Eric, you might have seen this if you watched the Big Ten Wrestling Championships on Saturday night. But the Penn State wrestlers did very well. The 197 and the heavyweight, they both won Big Ten Championships. Yeah. And they're Which both strong win. Christians. And they're both strong Christians. Aaron Brooks, when he was asked about his accomplishment, he steered away from the wrestling talk and talked about his faith. And the heavyweight, who's his roommate, gets up, wins a Big Ten championship. The young lady for the Big Ten Networks, very young journalist, yes. starts asking the, the heavyweight, and I, I know Eric saw this, he looks, he, because you just won, had a phenomenal season, you just won a Big Ten championship, you're, you're number one ranked to go to Nationals of Kansas City to win another national title. What do you think yeah. of all this? And he looked at the young lady, and what did he say, Eric? He goes, none of this even matters. Let's put this in perspective. I'm worried about my faith walk with my roommate. Yeah. The young lady didn't know what to say. Yeah. She just looked at him and said, can we go to a commercial break? I don't know what to say. <laughs> but Eric, did you say the same thing I saw? Yeah, I did. Um, it's phenomenal, it's, these, young, these two young men. You know, we, we took second place at the Big Tens. We're going to do good at the NCAAs, too. That's where Bill Lamb's going, too, because it starts next week. Um, but our heavyweight was good, but he wasn't as good as the Penn State and the other guy. Um, but, yeah, I did see that. Um, it's amazing. Um, Christianity, when I wrestled uh, for all those years, I wrestled for Athletes in Action. And I prayed right. in 39 countries with the world's best. And I took God with me wherever I've been. And what right. a mission I had to do my stewardship in a sport that was a tough one. <laughs> but I remember the days and yes, I, I, I'm very anxious because Michigan university, you know, I help coach and um, I'm anxious to see how we do in the nationals. Um, we won't come second, I'm sure, but we did last year. And, but to take second this year was pretty phenomenal. So when it's all Penn over. state, that coach is just miraculous. Uh, he was quite an Olympian, you know, He's a good, good friend of mine. But it's better to hear the young man say none of this matters. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to hear when you have a platform to give God the credit. Yes. You choose to do that. We are fortunate to see Christian athletes do that. And since it's so getting close to Easter, I'll tell my favorite Easter story that relates to that. It Because the Masters almost always bumps up around Easter. And you've heard this story before. Bernhard Langer, a famous German golfer, wins his first Masters in the late 80s. Not a Christian. In fact, he would tell you in his testimony that when he won it the first time, you know, they take the winner to the butler's cabin to present them with a symbolic green jacket. And before they go on live TV to show it, and Bernhard Langer, before he's a Christian, is taking the Lord's name in vain just minutes before they go on the air. So he wins this prestigious golf tournament. And a, a guy that used to live in this area, who I got to know, Bobby Clampett, was a a similar golfer at that same level. They were good friends. They entered the tour at the same a year. And they always planned to play practice rounds together on the Tuesday or Wednesday at the next course, which in that time and still is, is Hilton Head in South Carolina. So Bernhard wins his first master, I think it's 88. Tuesday rolls around or Wednesday, Tuesday rolls around. And for the first time, all the hubbub of the press is gone. And Bernhard and, and Bobby are walking the links down there in, in Hilton Head. And he has this moment where he says to Bobby, he says, in my bad German accent, he said, Bobby, I just won the greatest tournament in the world. And I thought that would fill up the hole in my life. But I'm still very empty. 
And so Bobby invited he and his wife to come to the PGA Bible study, which happens every Wednesday night, wherever the tour goes, led by, used to be Larry Moody, president of search ministries that I worked under. And I'm sure it was the very first night that he went or the next week, it was within a week of that. He heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. He gave his life full and completely to Jesus here the week after he won the Masters. So fast forward, I think it was 1992, correct me if I'm wrong. He wins his second Masters. Now he's got about the four or five years of growth in Christ under his belt. And this particular Masters Sunday is Easter. And so time is running short. That's what maybe run. And they want one comment for him before CBS goes off the air. Jim Nance, who was the reporter on the field, goes up to Bernhard Langer, now a Christian, and says, just wants one comment. He says, Bernhard, how does it feel to win your second Masters? And Bernhard Langer says, well, it's especially meaningful to win it on the day my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Well, back to you in the booth. <laughs> He is able, right? The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not. Let's pray. Lord, it is our privilege and honor to rehearse these words that are so old and timeless and true. That though the, the ridicule and the scorn may come, we have resources that are supernatural. We have a great shepherd. We'll never want whatever project you direct us to go into and begin to build, if anything, we're overly resourced. Give us the faith to believe and draw deeply upon your exceeding great and precious promises. A mass in our lifetime, big walls of evidence that you're still at work through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you. You haven't told me the score yet. And on the way out, I don't want you to tell me the score yet. I want to go home and suffer through it alone. So thank you. <laughs>